Hey guys, this is Jonathan. I'm back doing another game from the uh, uh, winning pawn structure series that I've been working on. I hope you guys have been following along. Anyway, we uh, we finished the games where we we're looking at uh, attacks on the E6 F7 square, and uh, now we're moving on to a different theme. Uh, the, the theme in question here is uh, is a rook lift. So uh, today's game is uh, going to feature between Benko and Philippe. Uh, from Vikanz 1970. Uh, so the game starts off as a Queen's Gambit accepted, which is an opening that frequently yields an isolated Queen Pawn position. So after some more or less standard opening moves, we get to this position, which I, I mentioned this once in an earlier video that this Knight C6 delaying the capture on D4 is probably better than the immediate capture. And the reason is, is that it's going to somewhat thwart White's development, at least in the way that he wants to have it. He'd like to play Queen E2 and Rook E1, uh, but because of the pressure that he's going to get here on the D4 square, he, uh, White's going to be forced to play Rook D1. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at that. Uh, so after here, he captures, and see, we had to play Rook D1, otherwise the, the pawn would fall. And so we get to castles, knight c3, and then the knight comes to b4, which is a pretty common maneuver, and uh, perhaps more successful now since we've interjected this a6 and then a4 lines, uh, making sure that this b4 square is a, is a safe square for the knight. Um, <clears throat> so knight e5, which takes advantage of the, uh, excuse me, takes advantage of the fact that the knight has left c6, and then uh, white <clears throat> Excuse me. Then black immediate plays uh, knight bd5, which is a really standard move in the uh, in these isolated queen pawns position because it blockades physically the the pawn push. There's just no way that that's going to happen right now. Um, looking at this position though, uh, we see that some of the other ideas that we've talked about in the, uh, earlier videos um, aren't quite going to work here. Notice since the knight is here on the d5 square that uh, we don't really have the same connection with our light squared bishop to go for a sack on f7. Notice we do have the our bishop, knight, and queen in the right place for that. Um, but it's, it's not going to it's not going to work as long as the knight is still standing there. Also note that the f4, f5 plan also probably isn't going to be as successful since we've been forced to to move our rook off of the f1 square a bit earlier than we would like. However, there is a pretty serious drawback to this knight bd5 and that's that the the d3 square is no longer covered. Probably better than dropping the knight back to d5 was either bringing this knight into d5 or bringing out the the bishop to c or sorry, it's a d7 there. But as it is, he uh, he brought the knight back, which is sort of a typical move, and we see rook d3 taking advantage of this extra space that uh, that white has. So one of the key things about the uh, having the isolated queen pawn on the fourth rank here is that our third rank is completely devoid of pawns, which uh, which means that we're going to be able to lift our rooks and bring them over to the king side for an attack which if our attack on f7 e6 isn't there and if d5 isn't there um, then this attack on the king side seems to be the most logical plan and rook d3 really starts that off in a in a nice way so we get to bishop d7 <clears throat> um, perhaps the best thing that black could have done was admit that uh, playing this knight to d5 was a mistake and instead of bishop d7 he could actually and it looks odd but just play the knight back, um, which means that if if white really wants to go for this rook lift and swing it over the king side, he's going to have to invest a pawn. So after like rook g3, uh, the queen can come grab, and then we're going to play bishop h6, uh, and this is going to force the knight back to e8, and then uh, rook d1. So white actually has a really strong attack. The knight isn't particularly happy here on the e8 square. It means the rook has no movement at all. Um, <clears throat> this, which means that this pawn is going to be permanently pinned. The knight isn't on f6 in order to help keep the queen out of h5 and g4. 
Uh, and all of White's pieces are working. This bishop is going to have a hard time getting over to help on the king side. This rook is going to have a hard time. Uh, this knight can make it back perhaps through here and then to the f6 square. But honestly, if that knight ever finds itself on d5, I'm probably just going to swap it. Uh, probably. <laughs> I have to decide if I want to allow this bishop a route in. But uh, but this is definitely a strong attack that, uh, that white gets for the cost of a pawn. So we're going to go ahead and go back. And instead... Um, Instead, uh, Black chose to, to bring out the, the bishop, <clears throat> which means that uh, we get rook g3, which already comes with a, with a threat of playing bishop h6, which again is going to force the knight back to e8, which is quite an awkward square for the knight. Um, <clears throat> so instead he plays king h8, just making sure that uh, he can meet bishop h6 with something like maybe rook g8. <clears throat> So rook h3, following the king across, uh, he's going to try and attack on the on the h file now, which means that uh, excuse me, which means that uh, he's going to have some real problems ever advancing this pawn because the bishop coming out for a sack, or or as we see in the game g4 coming up to to try to bust that pawn structure open. So bishop e8, which I thought was a bit of a weird move. I couldn't quite understand it, but I think the idea, of course, must be that he's wanting to guard f7 so that he can shift his rook over to g8. Um, but right now, I don't know if it's terribly clear that the rook needs to be on g8 just yet, and so I don't know if I would have committed the bishop here yet. Um, but again, I, I mean, it seems that he's being uh, trying to play a bit more defensively. Um, but this does allow a, a really nice and instructive move from from Binko at this point. He he plays knight takes knight, which is a uh, kind of a cool idea. So um, Black is going to be forced to take back with the pawn because if he takes back with a knight, we're going to get queen h5, and uh, he doesn't want to allow that. So like knight take knight, he's going to go queen h5. We're going to get the knight back, and then queen h4. And then he's going to be forced to play something like uh, like g6, um, <clears throat> and then and then that's going to allow bishop h6, forcing rook g8, uh, and black is going to have some real problems here, especially with this, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, especially with this uh, h7 square, and also with the f6 square. Uh, he can play things like queen g4, bishop g5, and rook f3, and really barrel down on this knight, uh, which is excuse me, which is going to find trouble getting any additional defenders. Um, <clears throat> so again, so uh, black did take back with the e pawn, and then so we get to bishop d3, which one of the really nice things about uh, the fact, for from white's point of view, that uh, we had to take back with this e pawn is that it shields our own d pawn, which means that we don't really need to worry much about defending it, because black is really going to have a hard time finding a way to exert any real pressure against this pawn. So against bishop d3, which uh, is immediately threatening some uh, pressure here on h7, for example, even just rook takes and then knight takes, followed by queen to h5 looks pretty strong, uh, or perhaps maybe bishop take, actually, yeah, because he has g6 at the end of that line. So bishop takes, knight takes, and then queen h5 uh, is quite strong and looks almost unstoppable as a mating threat. Um, so he played g6. If he plays h6 instead, um, this is going to allow another thematic sacrifice. So bishop h6, uh, which is going to clear the lines here. This is quite devastating. This is a pretty typical um, sacrifice in these kinds of structures. Uh, we're going to look more at them a bit later, but uh, after, <clears throat> after he captures the bishop, which is virtually forced, we get queen e3. Um, but Byrne actually in this position recommended rook takes h6. And then um, after queen g7, he says queen e3. And this is, of course, quite crushing. Uh, I mean, we have the immediate threat of just queen g5. Um, <clears throat> but the one of the problems is this is going to allow the this is going to allow the rook to come to g8 and free up this f7 square. Now, 
I don't want to suggest that black is in any way okay or safe, but it's a little bit more complicated. Um, the more straightforward move is just playing queen e3 immediately. Because uh, now, of course, rook g8 is just met with queen takes mate. Um, and this is going to be quite quite terrible. So, in fact, the, the best that black can really do is just give up the knight. Um, <clears throat> this is... And which which was going to mean that white essentially has won this pawn and completely destroyed the king side st structure for free. So this is clearly not clearly not acceptable and explains why g6 was preferred. So uh, black continues on bishop h6, which is going to get the bishop into the game and free this rook to come across with tempo. So rook g8 and rook e1. Now notice that uh, already. White's entire army has now been mobilized. He has all kinds of threats coming. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, even at the very least, he has ideas like just playing knight takes g6 and uh, coming down to win this bishop, which is going to pick up a pawn. Uh, lots and lots of threats already happening on the board. So bishop f8, which sort of counters uh, the threat of knight takes g6. Um, but then bishop g5, which uh, makes note of the fact that uh, the bishop isn't here to defend the knight anymore. So we have queen d6, which is trying to break that pin. But also, uh, black is all, or excuse me, white is also threatening knight takes f7. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, wait, not yet, not yet, he's not threatening that. Uh, he's threatening it. When is he threatening that? At some point this was a threat. Or maybe it is a threat. Knight takes f7. Uh, bishop takes. Hmm. Maybe not quite. That's uh, that lines in a few minutes, I think, actually. <laughs> so we got queen f3, uh, which again continues to amp up the pressure against this f6 square, and then so bishop g7. And now queen f4. Ah, here it is. Okay. Now knight takes f7 as a threat. Sorry, guys. I uh, kind of got ahead of myself. Knight takes f7 as a threat now because the queen is hanging on d6. And uh, also, the queen coming up to f4 has freed up the f3 square for a rook to come in behind and continue to add pressure against this knight. Um, so black chose to play queen b6, which is going to... which gets out of that trouble. But then just rook e3. You know, the first rook lift was so much fun, why don't we try another? Uh, but this actually comes with a, th with a serious threat. Not just the plan of coming to f3, adding pressure to the knight. Uh, but he's actually threatening something much, much stronger. So if we just make um, a nothing move. Uh, we, we have puts pull of bishop takes, bishop takes. And now we get this nice mate. So it takes here. And then the, this comes across. And then this mate. Or, conversely, <clears throat> if instead he plays with the queen, um, we can still just take here. And come across with check. And he's forced to block with the bishop. And this is still mate. So, <clears throat> this is the sort of the immediate threat that, uh, that black has to find a way to deal with. And he chooses um, to do that by playing h5. Which, I mean, clearly not really a move he wants to make because it's going to weaken his king's position some. Uh, we might look, there might be other sacrifices possible on g6 now. Um, but instead, the more direct uh, move, and the, this, is, this is an awesome move, it's just a5. Beautiful. Can't take the pawn uh, because, of course, this knight here would fall which means the only square he has to go to is back to d8. Still can't go to d6 because we've still got that knight f7 idea. And uh, <clears throat> so he's forced to go back to d8. But on d8, this knight is pinned again. This bishop is still, again, uh, looks like it's going to be forced to cover the f7 square because of potential forks here. So if the bishop were to try to leave and go do something else, bam, we're just going to grab on, on f7 when the queen. Uh, but now g4, okay, which is just going to crack open the king side. But, uh, I mean, even something as simple as just playing knight g4 is going to pick up this knight. Um, but uh, the move that Banco comes up with is even stronger. He plays g4, which does a couple things. One, he's threatening to take here, and he's going to try to open the h-file. 
Uh, but he's also making sure that there's no back ring problems. Um, <clears throat> uh, before, there's a little bit earlier something I forgot to mention. Um, so, after Rook E3, um, it looks like that uh, Black might be able to take here uh, because of the back rank issue. Uh, but now nah, we just take here, and if he goes in for uh, goes in for a check, we can just come back with the bishop, and uh, he's got nothing. He's just gonna lose the. He's just lost this knight here for for really nothing. So that's clearly not an option. So back to the h5, we get a4, fantastic move, and then g4. <clears throat> so white is, has a really devastating attack. So the rook comes to c8, which it's hard to see what else to do. Uh, this bishop can't go anywhere because this knight's gonna this knight's gonna drop. This bishop can't go anywhere because it's uh, this pawn's gonna drop. The queen can't really go anywhere again because of the pressure here. Um, this rook probably isn't gonna be able to go anywhere. I mean, you can move to f8, but it's not clear what's happening on f8, uh, and it may be needed on g6, as I said, against some some pressure here on on the g6 square. So he plays rook c8, just trying to get his last piece in the game. Uh, so white captures here. He's going to try to open the h file. We get rook c1. Uh, I'm sure this is really nothing more than a spite check. I'm sure Philip uh, was just just aggravated, and um, he probably already is considering resigning. But uh, I guess it's hard to resign when you're not actually down any material. <laughs> so just uh, king g2, and then uh, g takes uh, h5, sort of forced because if uh, black allows. Uh, this capture it's just mate so he's forced to capture and then rook g3 rook e g3 forces resignation um, so why did black resign uh, we I mean we technically have even material right now but he has he just has no moves and uh, not only does he have no moves but there's really no way to stop the simple threat of bishop takes and then just taking this pawn on h5, which is going to be mate. Uh, I mean, the when I looked at this game with the the engine, the engine is just suggesting some lines where he just gives up the queen for for nothing. Uh, stuff like uh, I think the I think the engine recommendation was even something crazy like this. Oh, sorry, here, and then just playing here, <laughs> just giving up the queen and the rook, just trying to stave off mate. So uh, clearly it's time to resign when the computer starts just dumping material to avoid mate. Anyhow, uh, quite an interesting and instructive game. Let's go back to the key point here when we saw that rook lift and look at see if we can look at some of the features again that told us that it was uh, that a rook lift would be successful. Doo -doo -doo. So we got rook d3. So. Um, <clears throat> key things that we needed to look at to let us know that this rook lift was uh, was available and strong. Uh, one was the to note that uh, we don't have the ability to play for d5 anymore because of it being firmly blockaded. Uh, we also don't have the ability to play for this f4, f5 plan. And uh, we do have this space here and open access to the d3 square. Notice that uh, uh, the three key files where the rook may end up on either C, D, or E, we have probably available one of those to us at some point. Um, so you can use any of these squares for the for the rook lift. Uh, we'll just click through the rest of the game again. It was nice. Let's look at it. So rook g3, just following the king along. This was an instructive moment, this capture here, which shields our d-pawn and makes sure that we have access to the d3 square and that no funky knight f4 happens later with this with this possible fork. And just uh, just bringing the pieces seamlessly into the king side. We avoided trades and then just uh, continued to force black's pieces into more and more worse spots, force concessions on the king side until eventually he just cracked and uh, ended up with this this fantastic looking position uh, I mean you just gotta look at this and just know that something's crazy is about to happen so uh, anyway quite an interesting game a really nice plan uh, we're starting to build a nice repertoire of plans to play with when we have the isolated queen pawn uh, I really enjoyed this game and hope you guys did too 
Uh, thanks a lot. Make sure you subscribe. I'll be posting more of these videos. I appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.